Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Good evening. We're so glad you could be with us in our Bible study tonight. We're going to start by using the first chapter of Galatians. And I'm going to read from the New American Standard Version, verses 8 and 9. But, uh, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Seems to me Paul's pretty sure of himself. I'm sure you've got some comments to enlarge on this. <laughs> okay, Gary, thank you very much. Yes, um, Galatians 1 is a very interesting chapter. Uh, what do we know about the history? Let's just look at, briefly at the background. This book, along with the book of Romans, were written over the winter of AD 57-58. Paul had just finished his four letters to the Corinthians. He had, uh, tr in the process of becoming very concerned about that very harsh letter he had written to them, which we believe may be 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. He decided he just had to find out what the answer was, and apparently it was close to winter time because he didn't dare take a boat across, because in the Aegean there, sometimes the winds get really, really bad about that time of year. So he walked around like 600 miles altogether, and somewhere about halfway around, probably in Thessalonica, maybe at Philippi, he ran into to Titus. And Titus was coming back from Corinth and saying, guess what? That letter worked. And Paul was so happy, he sat down and he, and, and he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, back to the Corinthians. He said, Titus, I still have a little bit of work to do here in Mesopotamia, I'm sorry, <laughs> Macedonia. Take this back to, um, to Corinth. He did, and a little while later, Paul arrived there, and they welcomed him, and he sat down, and he wrote these two books. And we don't know for sure exactly what route Paul took from Ephesus to Corinth. Uh, it's possible he even passed through Galatia, or the northern Galatian area territories, or at least nearby, and rumors came to him that apparently really upset him. Uh, we don't have any information about Paul spending long periods of time with the people in Galatia. Uh, there are, of course, theories that these are southern Galatian people. That would be the cities of Derbe and Lystra and so forth, Iconium, that he had visited in his first missionary journey. But uh, anyway, it's, it's questionable. What, what uh, kind of a town is Galatia? Galatia is not a town. Galatia is a region, and it was a whole section in, in, in the western part of what we would call Turkey today. And the reason it's called Galatia is because uh, earlier, several hundred years before, people from Gaul, which would be France today, had traveled down across this region and actually settled in here. So this would be, these people would be actually Europeans, uh, probably by this time mixed up with some Asiatics. But uh, they had come from Europe, across, across, uh, down through Constantinople, that area, and settled here in western um, the Western, what we would call Turkey today. A lot of French people. Yeah, yeah, Europeans as opposed to Asians, mm -hmm. okay? Remember that the, the line there right next to Constantinople is the, is the border between Asia and, and, and Europe. I never was good in geography. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I have another question. Okay. Uh, it says, um, he is to be accursed. Yes. What is accursed? Okay, well, 
Maybe if I read it from my Good News Bible, it'll be a little clearer. Okay. Okay. Uh, remember that the Good News Bible was done by the American Bible Society, a large group of scholars, and the aim was to put it in straightforward language that everybody could understand. Sounds So good. now I read, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preached to you, may he be condemned to hell. Ooh. Pretty we have said it before, and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. And the word there in Greek doesn't mention hell, uh, but it's a, the just about the strongest Greek you can use for someone to say, you know, he's wrong, you know, he's, he's condemned, he's, you know, it's a very strong term. Mm. So... Now let's come to the book itself. Paul apparently got down to Corinth and said, okay, I'm going to settle down for a few months here. I need to write back and try to straighten out these people in, in, in Galatia. And what was happening in Galatia? Why, would Paul, why did Paul think it was necessary to write a letter there? The Gentiles were being uh, circumcised, a lot of false circumcision. Okay, and why would someone choose to be circumcised? Well, it sounds to me like a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, more Orthodox Jews around, supposedly Christian, wanted to get back some of the old ways, and then uh, along with this, it seemed like some of the more indigenous folks were cottoning on to what they thought was a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. So they started preaching, but it wasn't strictly by the book, as we'd say today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It turns out that the, the northern Galatia area was an area where, uh, for whatever reason, quite a number of Jews had settled in there. So that may have been why it was fairly easy for the gospel to get started there. But uh, people had come all the way from Jerusalem and other things, following Paul around, trying to undo the, the, the work he was doing to convince people to become Christians. And basically, what at least some were saying, and they're called Judaizers here, uh, what, they were, the, what they were trying to promote is the idea, well, okay, it's all right to be a Christian, but if you want to be a real Christian, you have to observe all the Jewish traditions in addition to your Christian ways. And that includes circumcision, etc. And Paul, that really upset Paul. Now, let's be honest. Let's, let's, let's look at the whole picture here. Was Paul circumcised? Yes. Oh, he, had to have been. he had to have been circumcised on the eighth day. As a, as a faithful member of a Pharisaical family, he was circumcised on the eighth day, I'm sure. So why would he be so opposed to something that he and his own family was practicing? Well, he was circumcised when he was a Jew. That was long before he was a Christian. He's still a Jew. He's a Christian Jew, but he's still a Jew. It's kind of like we'd gone from phase A to phase B, and all that stuff early on was gone. Okay. So... So your question is, why was he so upset? Yes, and what were, and I suppose both sides. Why would what were these? I mean, these guys, these guys who were trying to undo Paul's work, they were they were they were like, their gospel was let let us undo what Paul has done. I mean, these guys were committing their lives to undoing what Paul was do, had done. So, what was their message? What were they trying to promote? And what was why did that upset Paul so much? Because they wanted to go back to salvation through by through the law, the Mosaic law, rather they were, than they were by trying faith. to promote the idea that somehow by 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 keeping some combination of the Jewish rules that they could earn a sal earn their own salvation. Yeah, he'd, he'd done a total about face mm -hmm. and thought he was making grounds and it was being pulled apart. Well, look at, look at what he says here. Look at, he, there's a brief introduction, and then we need to look at his actual words. From Paul, who's called to be an apostle, did not come from human beings or by human means, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from death. So, Paul is saying, making it very clear here, right up front, that he got his message from whom? Christ. God directly. Jesus Christ directly. He did not get his message from some Jews. He did not get his message from some even people who are leaders among the Christian church. He got his message direct. He's trying to establish what? His credentials. His credentials, yeah, his authority. All the believers who are here join me in sending greetings to the churches of Galatia. That's, 
That's his one sentence of, of greeting, basically. Well, may, our God, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I guess there's two sentences of greeting. In order to set us free from this present evil age, Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of God, our God and Father. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now he's done with his introduction. Do you think uh, these other um, uh, preachers that were going behind uh, Paul were shifting the focus on what you can do, this and that and this and that, so they would not study Jesus and his life? They, they, they were turning everybody's heads to all the uh, requirements. The gazillion little rules that they had developed. And, and when you're doing one thing, you can't do another. So when right. you're thinking of the rules, you can't study the well, life of Jesus. If you believe that you can be saved by keeping the rules, that's a very different thing than being saved by trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us to live better lives, mm -hmm. and he wants us not to steal or keep some sure. rules also. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that Paul was establishing his authority. Weren't these other people basing their ideas from their authority also? Right. And, and so, when he gets to Romans, he's going to say, okay, these people make all these claims. Well, look at my claims, look at their claims. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12, he just really beats that one. I mean, he really yeah, says, okay. At this point, when he's talking about the Galatians, though, uh -huh. um, what point is he making by condemning these people to hell? Well, he's trying to say, and that's a that's a very good, le very good question. But let me let me reframe it a little bit. Let me just read a couple of verses, and then let's see exactly what the question is about. I'm surprised at you, Paul says to these Galatians. In no time at all, you're deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. Who would that be? Himself. Paul himself, Jesus Christ, maybe and are accepting another gospel. So the question is about what? The question is about the gospel, right? right. They're and accepting it's also a different talking about them too. Mm -hmm. Why are they changing so easily? Yeah. But the, that could be a very important aspect also. Mm -hmm. Because he goes on here saying that he didn't change. I mean, yeah. he got beat up and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, there is no other gospel. Paul says. He is absolutely certain about that. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. So what is it that Paul is so certain about? They're getting off the track. Well, he's so certain of the gospel, isn't right, it? Yes. So he says, compared to what I know is absolutely true in the gospel, you people are deviating. Right? The RSV says they pervert the, the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty strong word. Yeah. Our version yeah. says distort. Yes, it's all shades, yeah, yeah. all of the above. Well, let me ask you a little question here. If if the Galatians actually went to Paul with some questions mm -hmm. and some ideas that were contrary to the the gospel, and they were coming off because of logical thinking, do you still think he would have said the same thing? Well, if they were if they were saying something that was contrary to his understanding of the gospel, I think he still would have said the same. No, what if, what if they came with good reason that, that he was doing, that, that, that they were looking at things a little different? Yeah. Would Paul well, have that same reaction, or would he just say that, you know, I'm going to have to work with these people some more? They didn't. I mean, it just seems like if they came across with those kind of questions, as opposed to what really happened here, they were changing their mind because of somebody's authority. Okay. You know, it, it would be different. A short time later, Paul wrote the book of Romans. These two books are twin books. So look at Romans 14, and I think that may answer your question. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Then if you drop down to verse 5, some people think that a certain day is more important than other days. Now, we surely think that, don't we? While others think that all days are the same, we each should firmly make up 
our own minds. Okay. So, so Paul is saying this, in matters that are less important, everybody needs to, well, he says, it basically on all issues of Christianity, people need to make up their minds. Yeah, but isn't that slightly different? Because they are coming to, to the point where inside, according to their understanding, mm -hmm. that they believe in a certain way. And it may be a weak understanding, but um, it's still an internal understanding. Whereas Galatians, you've got these troublemakers coming in, mm -hmm. and then they yield to these troublemakers because of some mask of authority. Because he even goes back and says that Peter did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that he was, he was living comfortably with the pagans until some people came in and then they drew back. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, like uh, he was not moving back on thinking, he was moving back because these people had this, this authority and they were, he, was, he was drawing back because of that. But Paul is trying to say here, look, he says, I told you exactly what the gospel is. And there is no compromise on the gospel. Well, I'm not so sure that it's exactly that. That's I think the Galatian, I think Galatians is actually talking about uh, people who, who are swayed because of authority and not because of thinking. That's because, that's because they're not firmly founded wow. in the gospel. It says well, that's true, but um, is it, why, if they're not firmly found, um, put in the foundation of the gospel, why would he come back and tell those other people that they should be condemned to hell? Because he's, he's, basically what he's saying is, if you accept what these other people believe, you're going to be lost. That's wrong. He, they're condemning you to hell. So I'm condemning them to hell. Yeah, but isn't it because that they're, they're accepting it because of who they are, not because of the truth? Well, if, if, see, if we, if we take that, let, let's just take your logic for a moment. If we take that approach, Revelation 13 says that very soon the devil is going to show up and he's going to convince the whole world just because he speaks with great authority. Do you want to well, join him? You're making my point. You're making Do you want to join him? You're making my point there because what they're doing is that these people are acting just like Satan. They're coming up with authority and telling them that you got to accept the law. You got to do what the law says. They're not doing it because of what Paul said, the reasons why Paul said it, but they're coming in because of authority. Just exactly what Satan's going to do at the end of time. Precisely, but it doesn't make your point. That what, what it makes is, the, well, maybe it makes your point, but it's too bad if it does. Because the truth is that the people who will stand firm on that day are the ones who are so settled in the gospel, they can't be moved. I have a yeah, question. but still, they're settled into the gospel because there's nothing else that can move them. It wrong. isn't because they're, they're hard-headed, no, no, right? No, no. Well, that's what you're saying, that no, they're so settled in that they're hard-headed that they're no, not going to no, do no, it. They no. didn't I, properly get settled into it. That's the problem. If you look at 11 and 12, yeah. he says, I would have you know the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he was, these other people were not going for all of that stuff without yeah. all the stuff that hung on to them. And that's what I'm saying. I have that they're, they're, they're not going because of Jesus Christ. They're going because of these people's authority. But that's, that's, a, that's a huge mistake. <coughs> didn't have the that's authority. That's a huge that's mistake to do that. I know. That's why, that is my point why, why Paul was so angry and said that. Well, okay, so there's, there's two choices. <laughs> you, either, you either can say, don't be influenced by what people tell you, or you can say, you better know the gospel. That's the two choices. If you say, don't be influenced by what someone says to you, then they're gonna, the next time Paul comes along, they say, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not supposed to be influenced by what people tell me. I don't think we can take that approach. Well, remember, Paul came in and, and explained why he should listen to him because he was not coming for himself. He was coming because of the gospel. Yeah. And he explained why, and he even went through his history and explained why. But he went, so, sorry. He went beyond that. 
because he explained to them that the gospel that he brings to them, the real gospel, has to do with faith. Uh, with works, they will never make it anyway because no man can, if you break one of those Hundreds bunch of laws, you break them all. So all the work is for naught. So when they understand, I don't remember exactly the Bible verses where you say when you drop seeds, oh. no, you know, in where the ground is this way, this yeah. happened, and this grows. I don't remember it verbatim. But it's the same thing. They were not firm. So they were, anything that came, they followed. They were ready to follow. Mm -hmm. So it hurt him because he was so zealous into trying to save them. And he wanted them to understand that being circumcised, that wasn't the way. It didn't do anything for them. And even the ones who were, being, who were circumcised, they weren't able to follow the law. So that's why, that's where all this came from his heart. Because he wanted to be, but that's Paul, Paul is all gun ho but isn't, he, isn't but Paul, doesn't Paul represent the the faith part and the the Judaizers represent the the works part mm -hmm. what you said was no. exact I agree with that completely mm -hmm. I'm just saying that you got two arguments here mm -hmm. well, and he's this. Paul saying Paul saying that if you believe because of authority you're crazy but if you believe because well, he didn't of say that, that's not what I heard. It. Well, He's that's what if that's what I hear. Something contrary to what Christ came to do for you, then let him be a curse. And it's not. I don't see it as he's telling them, let him go to hell. I believe he's saying like automatically that's what's going to happen to you because that's the choice you make. After you've learned the truth, you leave the truth to do something else. That's your choice. Just like when God, if we talk about God, wrath is just turning away. So if they want to turn away from the truth, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Basically, I that's how I see it. Uh, yes. Okay. As a, a practical person, okay, um, Paul told the people the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay. When he goes away, how are they to remember the specifics of the gospel? We have something written down, and I don't believe they had anything written down, did they? So how well, it seems like they could easily stray because he wasn't there. So how did they know for sure yeah. what he said? Well, p potentially, I, I mean, number one, they should have carefully remembered what he taught them. I understand that people's memories may not be perfect, but that was number one, what he had taught them. There also we know that the books of First and Second Thessalonians were available to them. Okay. Thessalonica was not very far from Galatia, and it's possible that they even had the the, the four letters, or at least parts of it, that he had written to the Corinthians. Okay. So then, if they had some documentation, they really had no excuse for listening to these people who said they had authority and were teaching something different. More than that, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that Paul told them when he was still with them, look, there are people around saying this and this and this. Don't believe them. It's not consistent with the Old Testament. It's not consistent with the Gospel. And Paul leaves a little while later. Here come these guys. Wow, we, better, so we better follow them. The Galatians are kind of spineless. They don't really stand for At what least some they know. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, verse 10, does this, and Carrie's already mentioned this, does this sound as if I'm trying to win human approval? I'm sorry, I need to read verse 9. We, we did that, I'm sorry. No, indeed, what I want is God's approval. I'm trying to be popular, am I trying to be popular with people? If I was still trying to do so, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let me tell you, my friends, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. And that's what he said back in verse 1, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't get it from any human source. I did not receive it from any human being, nor did anyone teach it to me. I, it was Jesus Christ himself who revealed it to me. You have been told how I used to live when I was devoted to the Jewish religion, how I persecuted without mercy the church of God and did my best to destroy it. I was ahead of most other Jews of my age in my practice of the Jewish religion and was much more devoted to the traditions of the ancestors, of our ancestors. So what was he doing? He was literally devoting his life to trying to stamp out this Christian religion. In, in today's world, then, we know the gospel, what it should be. But if we have a rock star tell us, and, and it's a person we idolize, tell us something different. We are, he was saying, may you be accursed if you follow that person. 
Yeah, it's true. But God in His grace chose me even before I was born and called me to serve Him. And I like to ask people the question, when Ananias received the message from God, go and anoint Paul so the scales fall off his eyes and he can see again, was, was Ananias more shocked because God said to him, go, this is my servant, I want you to anoint him, or was he more shocked because God said to him, he's going to be my apostle to the Gentiles? Probably more shocked by the latter, yes. you know? But Now, that's because Ananias was a Jewish person. Oh, yes. And so um, they had nothing to do with the Gentiles. No. And so to think that the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles, it was supposed to be all theirs. And yeah. Okay. So, and when he decided to reveal his son to me, Paul's still talking, so that I might preach the good news about him to the Gentiles, I did not go to anyone for advice, nor did I go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. Instead, I went at once to Arabia. What's in Arabia? Gentiles? A whole lot of desert. Yeah, <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And then I returned to Damascus. It was three years later that I went to Jerusalem to obtain information from Peter and I stayed with him for two weeks. I did not see any other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Okay? So, he went to Jerusalem, and this had been his home for years and years. The place where he went to school, where all his friends were, presumably where his family was. Now, his parents were in Tarsus, but he probably was married. He probably had a wife somewhere in Jerusalem. Maybe children, even. We don't know. Anyway, what I write is true, God knows I'm not lying, after I went to places in Syria and Cilicia, because he had been warned there when he got to Jerusalem, don't stay here, they'll kill you. So he said the only place he could think of to go real quick was back home to mommy and daddy. Were um, they going to kill Paul in Jerusalem because he had spoken to the Gentiles? No, they were going to kill him because he was preaching a gospel that wasn't the old line. That wasn't Jewish. Okay, he was trying wasn't to... wasn't the pharisaical party line. He was a turncoat to the main, mm -hmm. main party in town. Yeah. To put it bluntly. Yeah. Afterward, I went to places in Syria and Cilicia. That's his home, t home territory. At that time, the members of the churches in Judea did not know me personally. They knew only what others were saying. The man who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And so they praise God because of me. So that's what the Gentiles said? No, that's what the Christians said. The Christians said. Be, because they hadn't seen Paul, they didn't know. All they knew is he used to be a persecutor and now he was a Christian. So this is the message they he had. He used to kill Christians and now he was one. Yeah. So what do you think his point is here? Why is he bringing this up in the context of everything else? He's trying to say, my gospel I got from Bible study and directly from God himself I, it's not, you know, I'm not coming like these Judaizers were. I'm not coming claiming authority from somebody back in Jerusalem. Uh, the only authority that I, I can quote is God himself and Scripture. Scripture and God himself, that's my authority. Well, plus he's saying that he turned around. He could, he and converted. when you turn around, it, it's usually something else turns you around. You don't really turn yourself around unless something happens. There are probably people there that really didn't know his background. Yeah. But it's also very possible that, that Paul knew, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, it's possible he knew these Judaizers. But we're going to have to pick out, if the story gets even more interesting, don't go away, we'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're looking at the book of Galatians, and we have just gone through chapter 1. We turn now to Galatians 2. Fourteen years later. Now, Paul has been doing something. It's incredible to think what he... He said he spent three years at Damascus and Arabia, so that would leave how many? Eleven years. What happened during those eleven years? Well, fourteen years later, I went back to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Okay, taking Titus along with me. I went because God revealed to me that I should go. And in other words, who's, he, who's Paul taking his directions from? God. God. Does he get visions from God? <clears throat> impressions yes. from God? He, he talks about those in other places. Okay. Yeah. In a private meeting with the leaders, I explained the gospel message that I preached to the Gentiles. Now, what's he saying here? He's going to go on to say, no one argued with me. They agreed that my message was true. I got it from God. And you, you heard what I had to say about it back in chapter 1. I did not want my work in the past or in the present to be a failure. My companion Titus, even though he is Greek, was not forced to be circumcised, although some wanted it done. Pretending to be believers, these men slipped into our group of spies in order to find out about the freedom we have through our union with Christ Jesus. They wanted to make slaves of us, but in order to keep the truth of the gospel safe for you, we did not give in to them for a minute. What do you suppose these spies were doing? What, what, what kind of spies were these? Circumcision committee. <laughs> the circumcision committee? I see. And, and who were they checking on? Let's see who Paul was hanging out with. Were they checking everything that Paul said and... and checking off the kind of rules these people were told not to keep the Jewish laws? More than circumcision, were they looking at other rules? I don't think so, but maybe. Just, just circumcision. They, the main point they argued about was circumcision. And here Paul had come down from Asia Minor in this case, come all the way down here to Jerusalem, and he has someone with him, and they said, this guy is a Gentile. He's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. Furthermore, he hasn't even con been converted to Judaism. He hasn't been circumcised. And well, how do we know he hasn't been circumcised? We better form a committee and find out if he's circumcised. So they were concerned he was not circumcised when he was a Jew. Uh, he was a Christian. Gentile Christian. Yeah. So why did they want, uh, is it Titus? Mm -hmm. Why did they want Titus to be a Jew? In, as well as a Christian. Because that was the message of the Judaizers all the way around, and unfortunately, it often was the message of the Jewish Christians in, in Jerusalem. They, want, they wanted Christianity to remain a Jewish subsect. Okay, so first you had to be a Jew, mm -hmm. and then you could go on to be a Christian. Yes. But not necessarily. You could stay a Jew if you wanted to and not become a Christian. They were looking to make trouble. And, and some of these were some of the more reputable folks in town. And Paul points out, they don't impress me anything. I'm still going to say what I've always said. Yeah. Well, it sounds, too, like a power structure. They wanted to keep control yes. of not only the Jewish church, but... but here, and here's the problem. And let's, let's be very blunt about this. Paul is by far the most successful evangelism, evangelist in the Christian church. And who's he evangelizing? A whole lot of Gentiles. And if you want the church to be a Jewish Christian church, and Paul is adding a whole bunch of Gentiles, what happens? It drives you nuts. Yep, that's exactly what was You're happening. You're having all these strangers come in who have no history, know mm -hmm. nothing about being a Jew. Yep. Back to your question of spying. Uh, do you think that there might be a touch of allegory there? No. Why would I think that? No. They were looking to get because how do you way. how do you spy out freedom? Well, what does he mean by that? He said they. What he means by that is these Jews, and remember, uh, and maybe I need to read you uh, a passage. It's found in Acts 15. And verse, I believe it's verse 9, give me just a second, that many people haven't considered, they've completely forgotten about it. Um, it's verse, 
Um, this is when the church was first beginning, the Christian church? This is church. when they had that big meeting in Jerusalem, that first big meeting in Jerusalem to try to decide whether, what they were going to require of Gentiles. Um, look at verse 5 it is, Genesis, Acts 15 verse 5, but some of the believers, who are the believers? They're Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Christians who were still Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. And that's the kind of people we're talking about here. These people claim to be Christians, but they said, you can't be a Christian according to our rules unless you follow all the Jewish rules at the same time. They hadn't given up their Phariseeism, and Paul was, a, was, was their nemesis because Paul had been a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had been a member of the Sanhedrin. There's no way they could claim that he, he didn't understand Phariseeism. There's no way that he could, they could say he didn't understand the Jewish religion. There's no way they could claim that he didn't understand all the rules. And here's Paul said, none of that counts for anything anymore. And they were just, ooh. He leveled the playing field, and the Pharisees were losing their position, probably yeah. their businesses and their wealth, and that sure hurt a lot of them. Yeah. Would that be like us today? Careful. When, when <laughs> no, I, I'm thinking of an example, like if we have an all English speaking church and require everybody who comes in, you have to speak English, or you can't yeah. be yeah. Uh, a Christian. Mm -hmm. And, and sort of like putting that ridiculous rule on. We once belonged to a small church in a place I won't mention by name. Um, and we had just moved there because I was um, getting some taking some course classes there. And we visited two churches. We, had, well, we visited three churches. One was a huge, big church. And we just didn't really feel comfortable in that huge church. So we visited two smaller churches. These are all Adventist churches. And one of those churches was, uh, and we had just come back, by the way, from spending four years in Africa. One of those churches was absolutely, completely white. Okay? And it was a relatively small church. We were comfortable with a small church. Then we went to another church. And there was a mixture of people from different cultures and so forth. Some people who, uh, I don't know if they were really comfortable. Well, they were comfortable speaking English. But one of our best friends we developed during that time was from France. Now, obviously, their, her primary language was French. And it was, just, it was a difference in our opinion, my wife and I, between night and day. You know, here was a church that was just, the church we joined, the, the multicultural church was just exploding, it was growing, it was doing all kinds of stuff, and the other church was like, it, it was like, it was like frozen in time. Well, taking it even further, is it uh, necessary for a person to be a vegetarian to be in this Adventist church? Would, if someone is criticized for not being a vegetarian, would that be like not being circumcised? I I ju I'm just thinking yeah, of how we can modernize this. In, in, in some places, I, in a church that I grew up in as a small child, if you, had not, if you were not a vegetarian, you would, be, you would have been thrown out. <laughs> yeah. And, pretty, pretty and so, yeah. I, I, and there's lots of other places like that. Yeah. Where there were, at least in those days. And Paul would have said, that's not proper. Yeah. Paul would have said, that's not what the gospel is about. He, he wouldn't have said, vegetarianism is wrong. He would have said, that's not what Christianity is all about. Well, they just, they wanted to, I mean, the thing is that these Judaizers wanted to bring everything back. When they had, a, when they had the good news come, that means things went forward. Mm -hmm. But when the, when the Judaizers wanted to bring it back, they were nullifying the good news, actually, and just making them go back to where they were before. Mm -hmm. Well, we have gr uh, groups in our church that re want people to uh, keep the feast. Now that would be going back also, right? That's well, it depends. I suppose it would, be, it would depend upon if they thought keeping the feast some had something had, had somehow something to do with your salvation and they would say to you, unless you come and join us in our feast, you can't be saved, then that would be a serious problem. Other than keeping them for the pure joy of sort of uh, if seeing this is how a, 
Yeah, if this is an opportunity for Christians to get together fellowship. and fellowship together, that's fine. Okay. But if they're going to start saying you have to do it exactly this way, otherwise you can't be saved. That's like a Judaizer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There'll be people there from all walks of life and mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. But regarding vegetarianism, being a vegetarian, I don't, there's nothing wrong with being a, being a vegetarian because it's good for your body and what have, what have you, but Jesus himself says it's not what you Eat. Put, put in your body that defiles you, but what come out. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people will do more harm with the things they say and, and the reason a lot of them, tell, some people tell people, be this, be that, and be, it's not for their salvation. They're not thinking about salvation. They're thinking about their own agenda. Mm -hmm. You feel, you know, I think that's why it's wrong. Well, let's see how, Paul, how far Paul is willing to carry this. We mentioned about the spies. They wanted to make slaves of us, but in order to keep the truth of the gospel safe for you, we did not give in to them for a minute. So Paul says, I will not allow them to say, in order to be a Christian, you must be circumcised. I absolutely will not allow it. But those who seem to be the leaders, now this is now in Jerusalem, we're talking about people like James and Peter and, you know, very interesting stuff here. But those who seem to be the leaders, I say this because it makes no difference to me what they were, God does not judge by outward appearances. These leaders, those leaders, I say, made no new suggestions to me. In other words, Paul says, I came, I told them my gospel, they had nothing to add to my gospel. Who's, who's they, James and Peter? Well, the, those are two that are mentioned by name. Uh, there may have been, a, there were probably, well, there was maybe John, maybe, and probably a bunch of these Pharisees who had become Christians. So did James, Peter, and the others in this council agree with Paul? Well, apparently they did when, when talking about the gospel. When talking about circumcision? Well, see, that's where the, that's where the area of disagreement apparently came up. And we, we don't know. Um, well, we do know this, that, that in, in the Acts 15 thing, there's no mention of requiring Gentiles to be, become circumcised. So. When the, and they said, the Holy Spirit and we have agreed these following rules, and it did not include circumcision. Okay. So I, I have to go by that. That's the best evidence I have. Well, after talking about the leaders, on the contrary, they saw that God had given me the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter, there you go, the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. For by God's power I was made an apostle to the Gentiles. And that, you know, to, to the Pharisees, that's almost like, you know, like you rub a, a, your, your, the wrong chalk or you rub your fingernail on the, on the blackboard, you know. Well, the Pharisees didn't even let a Gentile shadow mm. drop on them. No. And so to go from that into caring for the uh, Gentiles and winning them over, and sitting next to them in church. Uh-huh. Paul, Paul was well known by these people, well known. And when you yeah. think of the timeline, uh, I don't exactly know how old Paul was, but he was still very much alive and well, yeah. and, and they knew who he was and what he had done. Yes. So God, like, turned a Hitler into a Jewish lover. Yes. I mean, he, God right. changed the personality completely, although Hitler did not let God work with him. Well, a very, a very clear example in our day, presumably, would be in places like Libya and Syria, where inner circle people connected to dictators and, and, and so forth kind of people leave it and join the other side. And they're not only now on the other side, but they're able to fill in what was the thinking of the people we used to be with. What, what are their tactics? What's going on now? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? See, when a top general from your side de defects to the other side, you, you, that's a huge loss. And that's exactly what Paul had done. He left the Pharisees and he'd gone to, this, to become a Christian. And the main man in power still hasn't changed his mind. No. Is what we're dealing with with these Pharisaical folks. Yeah. Well, James... He's mentioned, Peter's mentioned, and John, so there's three of them mentioned, who seem to be the leaders, 
recognized that God had given me this special task, so they shook hands with Barnabas and me as a sign that we were all partners. We agreed that Barnabas and I would work among the Gentiles and they among the Jews. And they asked what, all they asked was that we should remember the needy in their group, which is the very thing I have been eager to do. Paul had already been responsible for bringing a very generous offering from the areas of Antioch and Cilicia down to these people in Jerusalem during a famine. We, we can read about that over in the book of Acts. So the Gentiles were not having a famine? No, not at that point in time. So how far did Paul, how, how convinced was Paul about this truth? I mean, remember, and we have to keep, it, it's hard for us to do this because we think of Paul as a great champion of Christianity. We've got to remember that he used to be the a Pharisee of the Pharisees, okay? So now, think about that, and now let me read you the next part here. But when Peter came to Antioch, and, and, and let's talk a little bit about Antioch. What was going on in Antioch? Just about everything, I think. <laughs> okay, what we know about Antioch, two or three things really quick. First of all, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Rome, of course, was the biggest. Alexandria and Egypt was next, and Antioch in Syria is now the third largest city. It was a city full of all kinds of perversions and whatever like this. But what had happened there, you can read about this in Acts 11, what had happened there is Christians from Syria and, and, and Libya, used to be called Cyrene, Christians from those areas had come to Antioch and they had done something remarkable. We don't even know their names. But those people had said, we do not believe that the gospel was intended for Jews only. We're going to start preaching the gospel to Gentiles and see what happens. And you don't know who those people were? We don't know them by name at all. But had they, do you think they knew Paul and had been trained by well, Paul? Well, let, let's, let's talk about the rest of it okay. really quick. The answer to that is no. They had not known Paul, they had not been trained by Paul, but they got there to Antioch and they started working and so pretty very quickly the word got around that the church at Antioch was just exploding. So the first thing that happened is Barnabas went up there and he saw what was going on, he was excited about it, so he left, he says, we need more help here. He went and he got Paul. Paul had lived, lived just a short distance across the way from him in Cilicia, in Tarsus of Cilicia. And he, uh, he took Paul and he said, we need your help over here in, in Antioch. And Paul came. Now Barnabas and Paul, plus these other people we already talked about, were leading out in Antioch and the church was just exploding. It was just growing like the dickens. So Peter says, I better go over up, up there to Antioch and figure out what's going on up there. I mean, what do we do when we find out somebody's doing something and, and they're being really, really successful? Everybody wants to know, okay, what's your secret? What, how did you do it? You know, everybody and wants to know. Their names are not mentioned. Their names, Barnabas and Paul. But they came later. So these first mm -hmm. people, their names not are mentioned. Not mentioned. Names are not. And mentioned. the people in Antioch must have thought Christianity felt true, was true, and was such a breath of fresh air from the types of religions and fertility rites that was going on there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that Antioch again, looking back in Acts, was the very first place where people were called Christians. And the, the group of them still there to this day, is there not? In fact, they're quite under, they were getting along with the Syrians' uh, leadership, but they're under attack by the Muslims right is now. It, yeah. Is Antioch in Syria? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting though, we've got you know, Syria, there's Cops in, in Egypt, there's Christians all in parts attack. of Ethiopia, they're yeah. scattered all over even today, and most of them are getting persecuted. The same yeah. thing in Baghdad years ago. I mean, yes. it, it, what, what the policy has ended up with uh, driving out the Christians. Now, Just, was Christian a good name? Christian was not a good name. A good name. When, it, when it was first invented, these people, are, the, the, the people from Antioch were trying to laugh at these Christians, make fun of them. These are those crazy people who are following a dead man. That, that, was the whole, that was the whole point, see? And how, why, long, how long was this after Jesus had been raised, ha, was raised? This, this happened somewhere around 45, 46, 47 A.D. 
And Jesus had died and been resurrected on 31 AD. So there could have been people around who actually talked to Jesus yes. after Jesus arose. And so their laughing could have been uh, well, uh, not verified by someone's eyewitness. Yeah. By, by the time we're talking here, Peter had come there. He was an eyewitness. Barnabas came there. He, he had known something about Jesus uh, and so forth. Yeah. Well, so what happens? But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Now, this is a passage that the Roman Catholic Church has not been a long time dwelling on. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile believers. So what had happened? Peter, remember, had had that experience with Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. And he should have accepted that. And he should have said, yes, God is equally accepting of Gentiles. What happened is he, he got up there to Antioch. Everybody was very free and they were all sharing and so forth. Like, and the Gentiles were mixing with the Jews and all this kind of stuff. And Peter just sort of, oh yeah, I'll, I'll join the crowd. And he was doing fine. Until what happened? Some of those Pharisaical friends from, from Jerusalem showed up and Peter said, hold on. That's my home territory back there in Jerusalem. I better be careful here. So in other words, Peter, like when Jesus, uh, he denied Jesus, Peter again lost his backbone? Yes. He was running a double game. When he was at the Jewish well, heart, he, he, he lived like them. When he was with the Gentiles, he, he did another thing. But he, he chickened out yeah. and didn't hold to the principles he knew was true again it appears but, but this is the part that i'm looking at here that models the whole thing in my mind about galatians mm -hmm. because what peter did is exactly what the galatians did with these people that came into judaism mm -hmm. that they were they started bowing to them because of their authority and they started changing their mind because of that not because of reason yeah and i Which, think that again, that I, I think, I think that that is the, the real important thing about Galatians right there for us to understand. It's not necessarily that, that Paul was so, so stuck on something that, that uh, nobody could move him on that, that aspect. It's true it's, that's there, but, but a, a good important thing about uh, Galatians is about authority and what it is, does it affect you or does the truth affect you? If, if we're more influenced by someone we think speaks with authority than we are influenced by the truth, we're in trouble. Well, you know, when we're out with friends and some friends, um, we're a Christian and we're with non-Christian friends mm -hmm. and they start making comments about Christians and we join in and laugh and we don't act like a Christian at that time, yeah. that means we are being swayed by what we place our authority. Peer we, pressure. We consider, yeah, we consider them better than us and we're afraid to show our Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, goes on. The other Jewish believers also started acting like cowards along with Peter. He doesn't, he doesn't mince any words. What are these people acting like? Cowards. cowards. And even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. So the people who had brought, the man who had brought Paul from Tarsus to Antioch was now, well, hold on just a minute, you know, maybe we, you know, maybe we better bow to the authority of the circumcision party. And Paul says, I will not have it for one second. So you have the term cowardly, mm -hmm. I have hypocrisy. Yeah. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? What's his argument there? I, I like the way the Message Bible puts it. Uh -huh. If you a Jew live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by those watchdogs from Jerusalem, <laughs> you say what that? right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs just to make a favorable favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies. I mean, exactly. that's, that's the message Bible. And exactly. Right down exactly. the line. Right down so the line. Exactly. Peter 
fell prey to peer pressure. Yes. And Barnabas. Bad peer pressure. Bad peer pressure. Probably thinking thou being diplomatic, but actually it was very wrong. Yeah. Boy, Paul was sure strong, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very strong. So yeah, it's almost like he's that strength is is pretty impressive right mm -hmm. there. It's not really. I don't think he's really drawing on. On. What's the word? Um, insight more than he is determination. Mm -hmm. That. None of this stuff is going to sway him. None of this, this. Um. Well, a, a, but let's 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 be honest about this. Paul, as far as we know, has an education that's years in advance of yes. any of the other people in this group. Well, also, so he he, he probably was lot relying on that. He may have memorized major portions of the Old Testament. Well, also, he had the experience of God striking mm -hmm. him blind. Yes. And whatever happened there strengthened him for his whole life, convinced him completely. And put together with his intellect, it all fit together. And that's why we should put our intellect into yeah. the Bible. Maybe he didn't want to be struck blind again. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me the way he lays out his writings, they're very intellectual. Yeah. There's no waffling around, and yeah. when you think back, the Pharisees prided themselves on being leaders of the law. Yes. There's a legal overtone mm -hmm. in this stuff. Well, so far in the book of Galatians, we have seen that Paul has, has struggled with two things we've talked about. One, he wants to make it very clear that he got his gospel straight from God, and he did a lot of studying to support it three years out there in the Arabian Desert with nothing else to do except remember everything he learned from the Old Testament. I'm sure he had a fruit basket upset kind of experience. He had to rethink everything through, through those, those years out there. And then he came back and he began preaching and nobody could stand up against him. They couldn't answer his arguments. And, and he, he went forward. That's the way Paul was. And now we see even when it came to dealing with church leaders like Peter, he says, if you're not walking the walk, you're wrong. Now, I don't know if any of us has the courage to do that, but Paul did, and he was a great leader in the early Christian church.